Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. Today, I'm joined by Abdul Mohammed, a senior official with the African Union, where he is the chief of staff and senior political advisor on the African Union high-level implementation panel. Rising U.S.-China tensions amid the COVID-19 pandemic have spiked fears of what some are calling a new Cold War. Yet both the U.S. and China are major partners of African countries. Abdul is here to talk with us from Addis Ababa about how Africa can position itself strategically within this new world of today and tomorrow. Abdul, thanks for coming on our podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So before COVID-19 hit, we already saw a world order that looked in flux. You had waning U.S. influence, the steady rise of China, um, a new era of China-U.S. competition with the election of President Trump. From an African perspective, uh, what did this world look like uh, before the pandemic struck? And what were the major strategic challenges facing African leaders vis-a-vis the rest of the world? Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I agree with you. You know, the conventional wisdom by geopolitical strategists uh, is that the uh, global, uh, the post-Second World War global order, Pax Americana, started weakening, followed by breaking down long before uh, the virus uh, started. The pandemic, we believe, along with the upcoming very highly polarized U.S. election, seems to be amplifying and to a certain extent accelerating the competition and the confrontation between China and the U.S. And we have also observed that Trump, having seriously bungled the management of the pandemic, he found it uh, convenient as part of his electoral strategy to aggressively seek a scapegoat for his spectacular failure. And it looks like China and to a certain extent, multilateral institutions like WHO are are convenient targets. And uh, this, I think, resonates very well with his right-wing base. But the main issue for us is that while U.S. is overwhelmed and uh, preoccupied by short-term calculations, is China establishing itself as an alternative source for global leadership? Is it pursuing a long-term strategy to replace the US? Therefore, against this backdrop, Europe and the rest of us find ourselves caught between two opposing geopolitical forces. And that is basically the scene uh, that uh, will inform uh, the Africans. Uh, So, uh, uh, our uh, take is that uh, that Africans uh, cannot afford to be passive. They cannot afford to be spectators or be intimidated uh, or resign uh, in a very fatalistic way. Uh, And the fact is that we are uh, the weakest link globally. But this, the fact that we are weak, should not in any way deprive us of uh, positioning ourselves to be relevant, both in uh, managing uh, the current uh, uh, crisis and also uh, in uh, contributing to the shaping of the future global order. So as we look at the world order, it looks like the trends are accelerating in some way. I'm wondering if this pandemic is something of a wake-up call um, as you look at how Africa views the rest of the world, because of course many of these, many of these trends were, were already happening. So in what ways has the virus itself sort of created something new versus just sort of accelerating what was already there? Yeah, I think, you know, a good starting point is to acknowledge the fact that the past 20 years have been a very dynamic period in Africa. Africa was not stagnating. Africa was developing. Africa was transforming. Uh, 
Therefore, we do have an intense 20 years experience in dealing with China, United States and Europe and Asia for that matter. So when we look at that, for example, uh, regarding China, uh, we are aware of the fact that the Chinese engagement, uh, not only in Africa, but globally, is very strategic. As a matter of fact, Chinese do not deal with anything less than a 20, 25 years uh, time horizon. And, uh, and, and, and of course, in the case of Africa, we take that to be that the Chinese are here in Africa for the long haul. Therefore, 20 years we have had a sustained high-level engagement, especially since uh, 2000. Uh, to 2000. Uh, and as a result of this intense engagement, over $200 billion of investment was made in Africa in terms of investment in infrastructure, in trade, in natural resource exploitation. This was a period that Africa was also seeking a very engaged partner, and China was ready to do that. As a result, China has ended up emerging as the largest trading partner for Africa. Africa's quest for industrialization and integration is actually partly facilitated by its engagement with China and Asia at large. And, and, and the other thing that we need to take into account is China and Africa during this period have established mechanisms to sustain their engagement. The most important mechanism is the China-Africa Cooperation Forum. This is at the head of state level. It involves all the African countries. It takes place intermittently in Beijing and a selected African country. And this has provided predictability to China-Africa relationship. Now, on the flip side, on the side of the U.S., of course, the U.S. has also been a long-term power in Africa and invests a lot, uh, especially in, in the past few decades, in public health on the continent. Absolutely. Um, I'm, yeah. so, 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 so when you look at it and you see the rise of China as a strategic partner from an African perspective, does Trump look like an outlier or does this look like a new era to you? Well, uh, I think what I can say is that U.S. engagement is less robust, less predictable uh, than the Chinese one. Um, there has not been a tangible long-term strategic consideration guiding the U.S.-Africa relationship in a, more, in a comprehensive way. And it is also, uh, this relationship is also subject to electoral cycles as opposed to the Chinese. Uh, and uh, what that means to me, uh, this uh, uh, electoral cycle is, as polarization increases within the US body politics, it, it, the implication is that uh, the US-Africa relationship lacks a firm consistency. And as you pointed out, the focus is humanitarian, uh, U.S. has invested a great deal in our health infrastructure, especially for HIV AIDS and malaria. And by and large, U.S.'s engagement is, uh, is, is uh, what you call uh, uh, project-oriented. And as a result of that, it is not transformative relationship. It does not for provide for transformative trajectory, which Africa requires. Therefore, U.S. engagement, uh, if one is generous, is really work in progress. But the most tangible and consistent aspect, I must say and underline, of U.S. engagement in Africa is security. Security. Uh, and this is partly informed by the uh, uh, combating terrorism, the war on terror uh, doctrine. And, and that is the most consistent uh, one. But at the same time, unlike, for example, our engagement with Europe and with, uh, with China, and to a certain extent with some key countries uh, globally, with, like, for example, with India, 
we don't have, there is no consistent mechanism, regular mechanism for the engagement. In 2014, the Americans partly emulated the Chinese and the European Union and called a summit. This was the last year of Obama, where 50, all the 54 African countries participated. And that summit was predicted uh, to be a regular mechanism, like, for, uh, like the Chinese and the European Union, but never materialized. And the Trump administration never resurrected it or followed. But the Trump administration, the closest thing they did is to have a special meeting with the foreign ministers of Africa at the margin of uh, the GA summit, the General Assembly summit. Otherwise, there is really not, uh, they have not pursued uh, an independent mechanism that will predictably regularize uh, the relationship between the US and Africa. While, for example, the Europeans uh, have also made, just like the Chinese, uh, that Africa is strategic. Our proximity to Europe uh, makes it imperative for, for, for them to take us strategically. And there are, of course, historical ties, the colonial, uh, based on the colonial ties. And there has been, just like China, 20 years of intense uh, relationship, trade relationship, economic relationship, which in the past 20 years also tripled. Uh, and the other thing is the, China, the European engagement with Africa is multifaceted. It includes trade, it includes migration, uh, terrorism, uh, health issue. So it is really much more in line with the way the Chinese have been dealing uh, with us. Would, would you say it's true, though, that we actually haven't seen the sort of shift in U.S. policy towards Africa that many expected when we saw the rise of, of a Trump administration that was promoting America first with very populist language? Um, and yet, in many ways, there hasn't been the, you know, the massive cut, for instance, in foreign aid that some might have expected. Well, uh, there is continuity, and that continuity lacks, uh, as I say, as I earlier said, robustness. Uh, the continuity does not, uh, uh, does not communicate uh, seriousness about uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, none of the uh, people around uh, Trump, uh, uh, both uh, within the White House and with the State Department, none of them, uh, you know, have Africa... Uh, experts or uh, strong Africa, uh, uh, you know, n knowledge. And Af the people who know Africa are actually uh, are inside the State Department. And the State Department role in the making of American foreign policy has diminished drastically during the uh, Trump uh, uh, ad ad administration. Uh, the current uh, State uh, St Secretary of State Pompeo uh, came, came to Africa a few months ago, and it is very important uh, to contextualize his visit uh, because the U.S. annual uh, strategic uh, review, the one for Africa, I, I reread re -read it again recently, and what is striking about it is how it says very, very little about Africa, and it is all about China, you know, how basically to dislodge China out of Africa. That is the trajectory. And the recent visit by Pompeo to Africa was basically to promote that, it's just to point out what is wrong with the U.S., with the Chinese policy towards Africa. So they don't see us uh, on our own merit. They see us as their uh, uh, competition uh, with China. This is, this is what has accelerated during the... Uh, the Trump administration. Mm. And for and for our listeners, we actually we discussed uh, a lot of that topic with in a previous podcast episode with with a former top uh, Obama official uh, on Africa, Judd Devermont, uh, late last year, which which you can find, which which indeed covered this this topic about how the Trump administration was very much focusing on the competition with, with China and Russia uh, in Africa rather than having a more strategic 
approach directly with Africa. And the, Afri uh, and, and the Africans are very, very mindful of that. Yeah, that's interesting. And that's a, it's an important perspective uh, that I think people in, in Washington don't always understand. Um, so, so what we have here, summing up some of our conversation, uh, which, is, which, is, which is really fascinating, is that we have, from an African perspective, you have the U.S. as something of a security partner, but not necessarily as much as a strategic partner. And meanwhile, Africa very much looks towards China for economic partnership and as a, as a future economic partner as well. And then there's also Europe, which is, which is not perhaps as strong as either of those other two powers, but, is, but uh, does look at the continent a bit more strategically, um, both from a security standpoint and from a development standpoint. Meanwhile, we also have people talking about a new Cold War between the U.S. and China emerging out of this pandemic. So taking all of that into consideration, you know, what do you think are the strategic challenges facing African leaders as, as we start to look ahead towards what this uh, world might look like um, in, the, in the coming years as people emerge from COVID-19? Okay, I think that, that's very good. That's, uh, that's a very good question. I think uh, Africa must position itself to play a weak hand effectively. And we can do that. We have a reservoir of experience in just doing that. Therefore, Africa, I think, should position itself to prevail over Europe and China to cooperate on Africa. Okay, not to fight, not to pick unnecessary acrimonious fight over Africa, but to cooperate over Africa and really convince the, uh, the, the Chinese and the Europeans to strengthen both the global and the continental multilateral institutions. Because Africa pursues a multilateral approach to its development and to its peace and security, both within Africa and also globally, because U.S. will not. Uh, especially if Trump gets re-elected, one of his major strategic agenda would be the dismantling of multilateral institutions, especially those that have been benefiting Africa, like the United Nations. So we have an interest in China and and Europe uh, partnering with Africa in reforming the multilateral institutions and make them much more fairer, much more equitable, much more Africa friendly, you know. Uh, and, and, and what we see is more than the Americans, the Europeans and the Chinese are more amenable to this Africa interest, you know. So, if Trump gets re-elected, then Africa, while strengthening uh, uh, its relationship with Europe and China, should wisely manage the Americans. You know, uh, the Americans should be wisely managed so that they will not be disruptive. Mm. Now, let's zero in a, a bit directly on the Horn of Africa region. Um, you're, you're talking to us from Addis Ababa. And of course, we've seen the U.S.-China competition here already amp up even before the pandemic, um, for instance, in Kenya, and both China and the U.S. both have military bases in Djibouti. If the U.S. and China enters a new Cold War, uh, how do you see the Horn of Africa region trying to, to manage that? Um, and, and are there any opportunities there, or will it only present difficulties? I think there are both uh, opportunities and uh, risks and difficulties, as you said. And as a matter of fact, uh, the coronavirus interrupted uh, the engagement that the Horn of Africa has been uh, having with the Gulf countries and also within the Horn of Africa itself on emerging challenges uh, facing the Horn of Africa. Emerging challenges in the context of the fact that uh, our proximity to the Middle East uh, and, uh, and the Red Sea uh, makes us part and parcel of uh, the geopolitics of, of, of the Red Sea. Uh, you know, 40% of the global trade between Europe and, uh, and Asia passes through uh, Babel Mandap at the Red Sea. Uh, therefore, for all practical purposes, 
Africa and the and the Middle East and and the Gulf countries are both one security zone and one uh, economic zone, potentially one economic zone. And the Chinese do have a very visible economic presence in the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea and the Gulf through the Belt and Road Initiative. And they have invested a great deal on both sides of the Red Sea in terms of infrastructure uh, investment and, and also trade investment and to protect that or to augment that uh, presence, economic presence, they, the Chinese, for the first time in their history, they, start, they, uh, they established a military base in, uh, in Djibouti. Uh, so this shows the strategic value that this uh, region is having uh, you know, uh, for the uh, Chinese. Europe is also uh, heavily uh, uh, visible uh, in, in, in the economy. Uh, in the economic areas, uh, uh, because uh, because forty percent of their trade passes through the Red Sea, so they have a vested interest in making sure uh, that uh, that uh, it is safe, and which means they have also established military bases. European countries have established military bases in uh, in Djibouti. Uh, the U.S.'s primary uh, presence in the Horn of Africa. Uh, is basically security. Uh, and they also have military base. And as part of their war on terror, their military presence is, is, is uh, heavy. Uh, the Russians, uh, after the end of the Cold War, as you know, have been dislodged out of the Red Sea area. Uh, but they are making, uh, they are preparing uh, for, for uh, a comeback. Uh, and of course, U.S. has a major, major uh, economic uh, presence in uh, in the Middle East, especially in the Gulf uh, countries. So this is uh, uh, the mix, uh, you know. So uh, I mean, uh, about those Gulf countries, as we know, the the Gulf countries also have become increasingly major players in the Horn of Africa region. Um, is it clear yet how the pandemic may affect that side of this Red Sea? Um, arena uh, with the Gulf countries facing their own significant outbreaks, uh, but also the plunge in oil prices. Yeah, good. Uh, I think pre uh, pre uh, uh, coronavirus, uh, uh, one could say that the Gulf countries uh, were aggressively competitive, and and as a matter of fact, also very very ambitious. There is a, a deadly competitiveness, uh, uh, you know, about their policies in the in the in the region. Uh, but in the post-COVID, in the post-coronavirus, we need to really uh, monitor very carefully. Will that make them uh, make these Gulf countries less ambitious because of the collapse of the oil market? Will they scale back? Will they scale back? Will they be more amenable? Uh, to seeking cooperative arrangement to pursue whatever their legitimate interests are. Will the Horn of Africa in the post-corona uh, virus era, will the Horn of Africa continue to be seen as an, era, as an, an arena, the race, including the race for cooperation uh, rather than proxy politics? Uh, all of these things is to be seen and we need to monitor it very, very carefully if there are going to be any major shift. So it sounds like on in terms of the Horn of Africa relations with, with Gulf countries, perhaps this is an area where the pandemic could be an opportunity for, for a much needed reset, so to speak, in terms of how the two regions cooperate. Potentially. And, uh, you know, my hope is that uh, the Horn of Africa, uh, you know, first of all, we should get our, uh, our, our uh, house in order uh, uh, to be able to really engage in a strategic dialogue with the Gulf countries. And this is the opportunity. And hopefully the competition, uh, this uh, great power competition between China and U.S. on the one hand, and also uh, some of the Gulf countries, uh, will, not, will not drill it. Now... Zooming back out again to the to some broader economic questions, African nations have petitioned quite loudly for debt relief. Uh, 
and of course a lot of that debt is 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 held by 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 China um are we seeing any signs of how China will respond to that request um and and what do you think uh we should be looking for in terms of how they respond and how that uh, really indicates how they view this uh, strategic relations with Africa moving forward. Um, as you may know, Abi Ahmed, the Ethiopian Prime Minister, uh, sent a letter on March 24th uh, to uh, the G20, uh, which triggered uh, a very uh, robust discussion about um, about debt relief. And Abi, uh, basically, in his letter. Uh, forcefully articulated that the coronavirus is an existential threat to Africa's economy and proposed a series of measures that need to be taken. And uh, and the G20 have basically agreed uh, to do so. But to contextualize the role of China, uh, we need to to, to understand uh, that uh, uh, there are three key categories uh, uh, for Africa debt to address the debt issue. There is a multilateral debt, there is a bilateral debt, and then there is a private sector uh, debt. The multilateral debt uh, is probably 32, 33% of the entire Africa debt. The uh, private sector debt is larger. It's, it's, it's more than 35%. And the bilateral debt is largely the one that the Chinese are heavy, and this is debt to uh, African uh, government. It's only 20% relative uh, to, to, to the others. Uh, so after the, um, the G20, there are some movement in terms of the multilateral debt, and there are also some movement in terms of the bilateral debt uh, with, uh, with Africa. Uh, you know, as I say, China is the largest creditor to African governments, uh, China uh, basically supports the G20 initiative, uh, but they want to have a separate mechanism. Probably they prefer a separate mechanism that is now being worked out. Most likely, the Chinese uh, uh, habits or the Chinese approach is uh, to deal country by country rather than a blanket uh, debt relief. Uh, China is also uh, seriously considering debt restructuring. They have already done it, for example, for Ethiopia. Uh, China will also likely participate in collective debt forgiveness if it is well coordinated uh, with them. Uh, But what the Africans should do is to leverage their current relationship with the Chinese so that the Chinese could play a leading role in that. This looks like a period that will require great leadership all across the world. Are there periods that today's leaders in Africa you think can look back towards to learn from as, as they look forward into this world that, that you've described? Yes, yes, absolutely. We did have uh, two major milestones uh, for leadership in Africa in the you know, positive uh, you know, experience in, 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 in leadership in Africa in the past 50, 60 years. One is we did have a cluster of African leaders that made it possible for us uh, to gain our independence from colonialism. You know, uh, the first generation of African leaders, an important cluster of them managed to provide leadership for Africa's independence. So that is one major milestone that we should try to learn from. The other milestone uh, that we should also take into account is leadership that was provided in the 1990s, mid-1990s and 2000s. The period of the 70s and the 80s was the lost decades for Africa. There was an economic collapse, uh, you know, uh, corruption, uh, state failure, uh, you know, uh, elite that, that was parasitic, uh, an elite that was corrupt, was governing Africa at that time, a failed leadership. So in the, 19, in the mid-1990s, a number, a cluster of African leaders emerged to challenge that paradigm 
and reorganize ourselves in Africa by assuming total responsibility. And this was what I called the golden period in Africa, the NEPAD period. That is the new, uh, you know, partnership for Africa's uh, development, and which provided the basis for Africa's transformation. We now need that kind of leadership to take us into the next milestone. And this milestone is the new global order and Africa's engagement in it. We need that kind of visionary, capable leaders that made it possible for us to, trans, to transit from a stagnant uh, continent into a dynamic continent. And this is the time uh, for that leadership. Whether those le that leadership exists in today's Africa, I am, I, am, uh, I am hesitant to say with confidence, but, uh, we, but we do have a very, uh, what we did not have earlier on, we do have a very robust civil society. We do have emerging, uh, talented, uh, entrepreneurship-driven uh, private sector. I mean, the combination of the civil society and this new, uh, new, new emerging uh, uh, private sector, uh, uh, you know, can actually uh, uh, facilitate to trigger the emergence of new African leaders. Abdul, I think we could talk about these things forever, but I think we'll, we'll wrap it up there. So thanks, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and for this fascinating discussion. Thank you. Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity. And uh, I have really enjoyed this podcast. You know, I listen to it now regularly. It is the only one that is covering the Horn of Africa in a very thoughtful and comprehensive manner. Please keep it up. That's, that's, that's fantastic uh, to hear. And, and we're very grateful for that. So thanks, Abdul. And I, I hope you're keeping well and safe over there in Addis. Thanks for listening. The Horn is a production of the International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell, and our producer is Mae Francis.